How many of you like the holiday Thanksgiving? It's one of your favorites. Oh, yeah. You guys are like me. You like to eat. And uh, it is amazing to me that when I came to this church that I had never heard of congregationalism before. Uh, and, but yet, when they say they were part of the pilgrims, of course, all of us grew up learning about pilgrims. And they had the funny outfits, which turned out when I was in Boston, actually wasn't true. They never wore the buckles and all that other stuff. That was a cartoon makeup that didn't start till much later on. And that what they wore was pretty much what we wear. Uh, and, uh, and so we learned about the pilgrims and uh, growing up and Thanksgiving and all those things that come along. But when I got to congregationalism, I began to learn about the heart of that journey. Uh, what it took, what it was there. I'm a, I'm a big fan of church history and obviously giving my life to the church uh, for all these years. I, I love church history. And as you know that the New Testament, we have A.D. and B.C. And we know that B.C. BC stands for before Christ and right. And A.D. stands for? Very good. And, uh, and so Jesus came, changed all of history for even the way we record it in time period. For all the rest of history, Jesus came and changed it. Well, Jesus left, and we know that the disciples began, the 11 that were left, and they, they got Matthias, number 12, and, uh, and they went on to begin to spread the gospel in Jerusalem. And uh, they figured that was probably about uh, 30 A.D. to about 80 A.D. was called the Apostles' Age. Uh, and that was where the disciples kind of reigned over the church and kind of brought that kind of order in the church. So in other words, you had Paul writing the New Testament. When a church got out of line, Paul would send them a letter, and that letter would hopefully correct them. And if it didn't, he would threaten, I'm coming to visit you, right? And a Paul's visit must have been pretty impressive because things got fixed right away just under the threat that Paul was coming to visit. But you had these legendary people, these people of great faith, great understanding, who walked with Jesus and all these disciples. And one by one, they started facing persecution and death, and they're being uh, murdered at an extremely fast rate as uh, James was murdered first, and then we have all the way, and the only one that wasn't martyred along the path was John, and John lived to about 78 AD, uh, and then he died. After John died, all you had left in the church was pastors that Paul had appointed to different places along the way when churches got started. So you had people that knew Paul but didn't know Jesus, right, firsthand. So all of a sudden you have Paul's letters being translated in about 87 AD was the first time the New Testament really got put together. All the letters of Paul and some of the other letters in the Old Testament were put together and started passing around churches. So people were scribes, they called them, were writing out the, the portions, rewriting Paul's letters and making sure that every church that got started would have Paul's letters to lead them. But you can imagine with no more apostles, there was kind of left this loop of what do we do? Right? What happens when something goes wrong? Who do we have to look to that will come and bring the smack down like Paul did? Right? We need authority. So the church began to crave authority and it began to struggle because who's in charge? Right? Who makes the decision? Where does the buck stop? Who's the person that does that? Is it the deacons? Is it the pastor? Is it some hierarchy that we have in place to kind of bring the smack down like we used to have with Paul? And they began to struggle. About 500 A.D., the church had struggled enough by that time that the Catholic Church started because they were trying to take them back to Acts and they were trying to resolve the whole issue of what do we do? Who's in charge? And so the Catholic Church got started in an attempt to try to bring order to that charge because they had no apostles. So the Catholic Church started. And once the Catholic Church started with a hierarchy, immediately some people started, uh-uh. No, that's not the way it's supposed to be, right? The church is supposed to go forward as a church, not be dictated by somebody else, that the scripture is what was supposed to be leading us. And so immediately there was groups that split off from that. And that began the next 2,000 years of history. As you had two branches of the Christian church going in two different directions. You had the Catholic side, which if you follow the Catholic side, they had all kinds of fights and at one point had two popes and soon may have two popes again, uh, as the pope is advocating for women and deacons and uh, for other things. And there's a big rise up right now against how dare you change 1,000 years of history, which I can only imagine would be difficult. And, uh, 
And so there's this big fight right now going on in the Catholic Church, but it's been going on for a long time with different things as they've changed and morphed. And then you have the other side of Christianity, which is Protestantism, where Protestantism comes from. They separated themselves from the Catholic Church, and they've always been separated as, as part of that. As the Catholic Church, Church grew in power, what happened is they gained control. And as they gained control and power, they began to dictate that you could not worship outside of the Catholic style of church. Now, that was going on mostly in London in, or England. You had France. You had some of Germany. You had Italy. Some of those places like that were powerhouses of that. The rest of the world was being flooded with what we call Protestantism of the day. That was the Anabaptists. That was people who rebelled against the authority type figure and wanted their own style of church. And as we know, we had Martin Luther come on, which, by the way, uh, Halloween was uh, Martin Luther's uh, Reformation Day, where he pounded the, the, the thesis on the door and began Lutheranism, which then began uh, Calvinism, which then began uh, the Church of England having its own church away from Catholicism, but still a hierarchy saying you must worship our way. So in other words, if you wanted to start your own church, that was not possible. You must start the Church of England's church. Amongst that group was a group of believers who didn't agree with that mentality. They didn't agree with Catholicism, but they didn't agree with the Church of England either, telling them how they must worship and what they must do. And that group was founded in a little, small little town uh, uh, called Scrooby. Scrooby? Scrooby. Hmm. I know every time I say that, I want to go, what, bro? But, uh, <laughs> but they were a church in Scrooby, England. And they began to look at their situation and they began to face persecution. If you did not agree with the Church of England, they said, that's fine. You don't have to agree with us. But you can't do anything about disagreeing with us. So you are allowed to have your own belief. We're fine with that. But if you decide to have a house church, we're not fine with that. And, uh, and so let me give you a couple of the names of the first couple people that were called separatists. Uh, the Scrooby group of separatists were Richard Clifton, who was the pastor, John Robinson as a teacher, and William Brewster as the ruling elder. Uh, the young William Bradford was also part of that group, becoming like a son to the older Brewster. Prior to meeting at Scooby. The group had been holding services All Saints Church, part of the Church of England, where Clifton had been a minister from 1586 until 1606, at which time he lost his job due to his group's nonconformists. So their group was starting to form, and he lost his job and became pastor of this house church, basically. Uh, William Brewster was the postmaster in Scrooby and lived in the village's large, held their services at the manor house in Scrooby from 1606 to 1607. Uh, as the Church of England's property, what began to happen is they began to face persecution. And the pastor who I just mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, his best friend was hung as a result of starting a separatist church. So as persecution began to take place, the pilgrims, who were just called separatists at that time, uh, just got, had a meeting and they decided that they needed to get out of England. Does anyone know where they went? Some of you have actually been to where they went. The Leiden. Right? So how many of you guys have been there? You guys, some of you guys went on a trip there. That is amazing. Following your pilgrim brothers. That's cool. Uh, they went to Leiden, but they didn't just go to Leiden because they had nothing else to do. They went to Leiden because, if you can imagine, if you were to pack up and move your family, say you're getting persecuted here in, in uh, Clarkston, and you decide to move to, I don't know, Ohio. Ah, never mind. No one would go there. Uh, <laughs> that was a far stretch. Uh, we'll say Indiana. Uh, so if you're going to go to Indiana... One of the things you would want to make sure you have is what? A job, right? You want to go there to get a job. You need a job. And so finances are always going to be a part of every move. And what you see is the pilgrims here moved there because they needed work. And when they got there, they had the freedom of religion for the first time. But could you imagine if we packed up half our church and you guys sold everything you had and left? Followed me. To Indiana, that'd be an adventure, wouldn't it? <laughs> but if, if, we, if we could think about it just for a second in those kind of terms, we, we realize that this wasn't just an easy thing. You're leaving family, you're leaving all your friends, 
You're leaving everybody to go and try to get religious freedom because worshiping God the way that you value is so important to you to be able to worship God. But it wasn't just worshiping God. They wanted to spread what they believed to other people because they felt like it was a freeing form of worship. So they went there. But after a while, they, they lost all financial ability there. And they began to figure out where do we go next. And the church began to meet. And they began to talk about all the different things. And they ran across this verse that you read at the beginning of the service. And it says this. All these people died, still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country that came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God. And he has prepared a city for them in Hebrews. Could you imagine running across the scripture as you are nomads? You left your home in Scrooby. Now you're over here and you can't live here very much longer. And you're looking for a new place to live. And this verse comes along at the same time that they have an opportunity to go to this new land called America. And so they're contemplating, which, should we go or should we not go? And then they read the scripture. Have you ever had scripture do that in your life? Anyone? Where you read a scripture and you called it your own, you're basically like, this is for me. I'm reading the scripture. It's, it might as well say, hey, Tim, right before it starts, right? That's what they thought when they saw this. And they decided to go on a journey to America. And so they packed up their family and got a big group of people to go with them. And they rented a ship called the Mayflower. Now this story you all know. As they come to the United States, and you may not know all the things about their journey. You may not know that one of my relatives was on the Mayflower. Um, and he was the guy who walked out on the ship during a storm and was swept overboard. Yes, the apple does not fall far from the tree. <laughs> and he grabbed a rope at the last second, which saved his life and saved also John Candy's life. Right? Yes, I, I'm related to John Candy. Uh, and, uh, but saved their lives. And, and as they, the journey over was un, unbelievably tough. It was rough. They didn't have cruise ships. They didn't have their own sleeping quarters. They didn't have people making food for them and bringing it to them. When you sailed in those days, which in 2020, we're getting ready to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the pilgrims coming to America, and they redid the Mayflower, and they're actually sailing it from England to land at the same time that it landed in the United States, and they made it exactly the same, right? 100% same, except for GPS, <laughs> ways that they could communicate, and pretty much all the luxuries of life. I guarantee you that sailing crew is not eating leftover fish that has been sitting in barrels for months and months and months, right? And they're, but they're sailing it anyways across the ocean to try to relive those adventures. And that's really what it becomes. But the journey across would have been difficult. There was two babies born uh, on the journey across. Uh, no doctors, just people uh, on board. Sicknesses, because obviously... Uh, how many of you guys have motion sickness? Uh, raise your hand. Okay, don't go sailing with any of those people. Writing it down in my head. All right. And uh, my father is a big motion sickness guy. Uh, he, he, we, you go anywhere on a boat with him, he's going to throw up. And uh, I can only imagine what it would have been like if you got on a boat that sailed across the ocean through storms and everything else. There would have been a lot of sick people. There would have been a lot of tight compartments. And the Bible says that they worshipped or not the Bible says, but the book says that they worshipped as they came across. They worshipped God in the rough situations. And then when they land, they have all these issues that they couldn't find the spot that they were supposed to land to, and they ended up, and they finally ended up at Plymouth Rock, uh, and they came aboard. But the journey is an interesting thing, because we are still to the journey of the pilgrims. Do you realize that? That although one million people trace their heritage back to the pilgrims in the United States of America, uh, over one million. The reality of the situation is we are congregationalists. Because we are congregationalists, we are actually what the pilgrims were in the beginning. They were seeking a new home that they could worship the Lord, but also 
a heavenly city that they could bring the gospel to. Now, they came over here because the opportunity was also great for making money. When you have a new land, you have a lot of new stuff. You have new Indians. You have new things that people in England don't have, right? What, did I say something wrong to the new Indians? I mean, the old Indians were all uh, overseas and other places. These were new Indians that nobody had gotten in contact with. Uh, and so they had trade things they could get. They had precious gems. They had uh, tobacco that they were uh, farming at a, at a large rate. Uh, and all those things that were going on, they had new opportunities for, to make money. So it wasn't just, just church. And people always say, well, I, I was reading on the internet, they were like, the pilgrims didn't come here for God, they came here for money. That's not true. But you'd be a fool if there was no way you could make money for your family. I mean, there has to be opportunity. Uh, and so they came here for that. But I wanted to talk quickly just about the journey and a few things that we can learn as great lessons for us on this journey as we continue. And that is it requires a strong faith. Hebrews 11, by the way, is the faith chapter. They were actually studying the faith chapter of the Bible when they decided to leave everything behind and trust God. Here's a couple things that a strong faith needs. Number one, the ability to overcome fear. You think they had some fear? Yeah, they had some amazing fear. Crossing an ocean with their kids right? Within the first year, half of them died. That's a strong faith to continue to worship God, to continue to be faithful to God and believe Him. But it also overcome worry. Worry changes us up. Worry is the biggest killer of faith in our lives. And we all know what that's like. Things you cannot control. They can't drive the ship. They can't steer the boat. They can't provide safety for themselves. They have to trust in the Lord to do those things. So they have this unbelievable faith in God that helps them to get across this journey. And it's a reminder to us that as we continue the pilgrim's journey, we've got to remember that a strong faith helps us get through the toughest times. We're all going to face disaster and trials in our life. And that faith brings us through. The second thing is a strong support. Imagine this, that if you were to pack up 100 people and go across the ocean to a new place, wouldn't you make those sure those hundred people were people you get along with? I can imagine as they're picking the hundred people to go with them, I'm sure the pastor of that church was going, no, you can stay. You can go. Really, we're going to leave you behind just to protect what we've left here. Uh, you would want people that give a good support structure for you, right? People that stand by your side. People that support you. So in other words, when they landed and that first winter, half of them died, you want people who are going to adopt their children when the family dies. You want people that are going to care for you when you're sick, even though you may be sick. You want people that are going to stand by your side and pray for you when you need prayer the most. You're looking for that support structure that stands by you in your darkest moments. You realize that's what Jesus gave to the world of Christianity when he gave us the church? He gave you a support structure. There's people all the time, I hear it all the time when I'm out there talking with people. They'll say to me, I don't need the church to worship God. No, you need the church for support. You're right, you can worship God at home. There's probably people today that are worshiping God at home this morning, right? You can worship God anywhere, but when it's time to face disaster, when there is a test and there is a storm on the water. The church is designed to support you. Do you know why a bunch of other villages failed before the pilgrims got there? There was whole villages that came to America that disappeared. You know why? They didn't have the same support structure that Christianity gives a deep love for your neighbor and your friend. That's why they stood the test of time. That's why they didn't pack up and leave when the Mayflower went back to England. That's why they didn't quit. They had a strong support. The last thing is a strong resolve. They had an unbelievable never quit attitude and keep moving forward. I love that about the church, but I also love that about this church. It's one of the things that I admire most about some of the faith keepers of this building that have kept the faith going, that you were the pilgrims. You were true to the pilgrims' call. 
You didn't just quit on congregationalism when you had a pastor you didn't agree with. You didn't quit on congregationalism when you had division in the church. You didn't quit on congregationalism. You continued to be the pilgrim that carries and never quits the journey. Why? Because the church is important because it is the only place to actually come together and worship God together. It's the place to worship God. When they left and came to America, they wanted a free place to worship God and believe God and have nobody telling them what they had to believe, but they had these scriptures called the Geneva Bible at that time that they would open and study and say, this is who we need to be because the Bible tells us we need to be this. We never quit. We don't quit because Jesus never quit on us. In their readings, it's amazing to hear how much they reflect back as they're facing trials and tribulation, how much they reflect back to that Jesus never quit on them. They were constantly reminding themselves that Jesus gave his all for them so they will give their all for him. And they developed the country we have today. It is amazing as we dive into freedom next week and what it actually meant to the pilgrim and what it should mean to us. As we dive into all that next week and we talk about veterans and and the veterans of our faith, but also the veterans that kept, kept America the uh, way it is right now. We, we'll, we'll deal with all that. But one of the things that I want you to remember today is that we are still pilgrims. We need to work on our faith constantly. We need to obviously continue to support the structure that is here that helps people and helps each other by attending and being faithful to God. And the last thing is never quit. Don't quit. Remember that Jesus gave his all for you because he loved you. Oh, by the way, that's what communion is. Communion is Jesus never quitting on you. He had every right to. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. He had every right to quit on you. You failed. He didn't. But instead, he loved you more than your sin, loved you more than your mistakes, loved you more than your problems, loved you more than your issues, loved you more than your relationships, loved you more than all the disappointments in your life, loved you more than everything, and he went to the cross that day, and he died for you, with you on his mind, and me on his mind. When Paul wrote to the church of Corinthians, he said to them, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On that night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And then it goes on to the only warning label in the Bible about communion. And that is this, that please do not make a mockery out of communion. Now, that's not saying that we can't laugh and enjoy the great gifts of God. What he's saying by mockery is this, that if you take communion with sin in your life, you're mocking the very act that Jesus did on the cross because he died for forgiveness of sins. So he warned the Corinthian church when it had all kinds of issues. He said, before you even take of communion, take a moment, examine your life, make sure that this morning you're as clean as clean can be before you take that cup. Because that's how important God made it. That when you take that cup, when you take that bread, your heart is clean before God this morning. So let's take a moment and you and me make sure we're clean this morning. Let's pray. As our diaconate board comes down, keep talking with God as needed this morning. The first thing he did was he took the bread, which was common for survival in those days. Bread meant life. Bread meant opportunity. Bread meant you weren't going to starve. Bread had so much powerful meaning in those days. And he took it for a reason. Not only the symbolism, the Bible says he broke it so that they could see what it's like to have a torn body 
because uh, it does look like flesh when it's torn. Uh, but also to understand that he was giving his life so that they could have life. And bread meant life. So they would get the connection with that. The Bible says after he broke it, he prayed, Lord, I thank you and I praise you for giving your body this morning that we can remember what it is to have communion with you, but also to understand that you never quit on us. That you loved us so much, you died for us so we could have forgiveness of sin. We could have life in the bread. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not die but have everlasting life. He came so that you would have life. He said, do this in remembrance of me. The Bible says after supper, he brought out the wine, which isn't the wine that we have today in our culture. They used alcohol and wine to kill the germs of water that was not filtered. And so it tastes a little bit different than what we would experience if we drank wine today. But he brought that out and he said, this is the new covenant. It's amazing to me that we, as non-Jewish people, miss the connection with that. The bread was life, but the blood was something they understood for forgiveness up until that point. They would have to sacrifice an animal at the temple to get temporary forgiveness of their sins. Jesus was saying the new covenant is you won't have to do that anymore. I will forgive your sins for all time by my blood. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your blood that you gave us on that day, on that cross. Thank you for being a loving God who cared so much that you would send your son to die for us. May as we drink this today in remembrance of you, may we constantly have the thought of forgiveness on our minds and the fact that we are sinners, but we are loved sinners, saved by grace, and that we have been forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen.
I think I saw some foot washing going on up here. Yeah. Never ceases to amaze me. Nothing's ever perfect, right? Mistakes happen. Things get dropped. But I love the illustration. You know what's hard to clean up? Blood. Grape juice. But you know what? I think there was a purpose for that. Because he never wanted you to clean it up. He wanted you to always understand that that was there for you. That he shed the blood for you. That you would have life. And so this morning... Do that in remembrance of Him. The Bible says we do that as a constant reminder until He comes again. And uh, So stand with me as we sing a, a hymn called, God our Father, we adore Thee.
Now today we have a unique opportunity when we leave here today to go out and uh, pay our final respects for Chuck. Um, and as you know, if, if you're new here, uh, you probably never got to meet Chuck, uh, one of the sweetest elderly gentlemen I think I've ever met in my entire life. He stood at the door faithfully every week and greeted every person who came through these doors. Now he's greeting people in heaven, and we're going to go out and uh, do his burial. And please join me out on the porch immediately after this, uh, before coffee hour. If you knew Chuck and you want to celebrate his home going right there, then please join us afterwards. And then we'll go down, and we've got food and all kinds of stuff to celebrate Chuck's life. But let's pray, uh, and then let's go out there. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you have given us. You are an amazing God. You care for us, and you love us. You're always good to us. Lord, I ask that you would give blessings on every person who came today. They gave up their Sunday to worship you. And Lord, we just ask that you'd bless their lives, give them peace, joy, and love. I thank you for Chuck and his life here. May we honor him well in just the next couple of minutes. In Jesus' name, amen.